Welcome, thank you for being here. We have a lot to cover today, and so without any preliminaries, I am going to jump directly into our lecture on continental skepticism. There are some issues here that I want to draw your attention to that come up as recurring themes. First of all, some philosophical doctrines. The most important of these, and one that we will see in almost every form of skepticism, is anti-supernaturalism, a kind of naturalism that denies the existence of or the rational believability of supernatural intervention. There are various reasons for this. Not all of the reasons are the same as Hume's reasons, but you'll find that for, in one way or another these come up over and over, and we'll see them today in the work of Voltaire and Rousseau. Second is mechanism, the idea that the world is a machine, that man is a machine, and that mechanical explanations suffice to cover all phenomena, that there's nothing about the human frame, there's nothing about the universe that cannot be dealt with in a mechanical model. Third, and closely related to mechanism, is determinism, the idea that there is no such thing as free will, that everything happens in rigid accordance with natural law and prior conditions. And the fourth philosophical doctrine that we'll see resurfacing comes up, of course, only after the time of Hegel, and that is the Hegelian dialectic that I mentioned in Tuesday's lecture. The idea that progress occurs by a clash of a thesis with an antithesis, and these are then synthesized, put together into some new third thing, which in turn develops its own antithesis, and so the process goes onward. Also, and especially in the 19th century, we're going to run into some methodological issues in doing history. Two of these are very, very important. One is the question, how do we handle apparent discrepancies in narratives and in testimony? Do they invalidate the testimony? Do they show us that the narrative is false because a different narrative gives different details? Do they leave us in indecision? or are they to be expected in the work of truthful writers or speakers? A second issue is the, how we deal with arguments from silence. What do we make of the fact that a particular author at a particular time simply does not mention an event or a fact that we consider to be of great importance? The proper methodological treatment of arguments from silence is something that will come up increasingly as we move into the 19th century and study the works of Strauss and Bauer and the Tübingen School. So I mentioned that continental skepticism was centered in France and heavily influenced by English deism. We'll talk about that in a moment. Broadly speaking, there are two phases of continental skepticism, a deistical phase and an atheistical phase. Different writers contribute to these. Um, Continental skepticism forms the philosophical groundwork of the French Revolution. And in fact, Christian churches were closed, Christian worship was abolished for a time during the Revolution. Uh, that did not end well, as you will see when you peruse stories about what happened between 1789 and 1794. And uh, by a curious kind of historical process, it gave rise to the most absolute dictatorship that Europe has ever seen, the dictatorship of Napoleon. Historically, the backdrop for continental skepticism is an interesting one. We have to go back to France around 1750. This is a world lit only by fire. Uh, electromagnetism has not been harnessed. They don't even have gas lights in the streets. The steam engine has not yet been developed as a commercial engine. It's not powering ships. Ships are crossing the oceans using sails and the best reckoning they can. They don't have a solution yet in 1750 to the problem of longitude, of how far east or west a ship is on the open sea. And this makes for great difficulties in maritime trade. We are standing just at the threshold of the Industrial Revolution, which is typically thought to have begun around 1760. We're not there yet. There is no such thing as freedom of thought or discussion in France or Spain or Portugal. Across the English Channel, of course, there's plenty of freedom of discussion, and the Deist controversy had been raging and pretty much burned itself out over there. 
uh, no notably without anyone's being killed in the process. Wollston was imprisoned for a time, not for having attacked the scriptures, but for having done so in a ribald and blasphemous manner. There's a little piece from Voltaire's philosophical dictionary called Freedom of Thought, or sometimes translated Freedom of Sentiment, and that should be available to you here. It's quite short, and of course, as all of Voltaire's work is, it's uh, a little bit overdone. He's exaggerated the characteristics of the individuals for the sake of his little drama. But it's a conversation between a bold mind who is an Englishman and a timid soul who is Portuguese and doesn't dare speak his mind or think any thoughts that are not already handed to him. Uh, Voltaire, who had visited England, was much impressed by the liberty with which people could speak their minds there. And so one of the things that he brought back was a blistering critique of the European repression of free thought. The philosophical roots of continental skepticism go back to Locke's essay concerning human understanding. John Locke was the philosophical voice of the Royal Society for the Advancement of Knowledge, the scientific society in England, which boasted such luminaries as Robert Hooke and Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton. These were great names, and Newton the greatest of them all. Locke, who was a close friend of many of these people, wrote his essay concerning human understanding as an attempt to articulate what the new empiricism amounted to. And he stresses the idea that the senses are a major source of our knowledge, that every concept we have can be traced back to its origins in sensation. However, Locke did not believe that there was no such thing as the rational faculty of the mind. He had both parts. When Locke's work jumped across the English Channel to France, it was taken up first by some deists in England, actually, by or Ireland, by Toland and Collins, but then by Voltaire and Condillac in particular. And they were actually stuck on the idea of pardon me for a second. They were stuck on the idea of sensation and not the rational faculty. And in fact, they provoked a reaction from the Scottish common sense school, which took the rational faculty to be a major source of our ideas. But Condillac and his followers said that sensation was everything. And in fact, this was later extended by some of these more atheistic uh, philosophers of the second part of the French skeptical movement or the continental skeptical movement to say that our moral sense as well is entirely a function of the sensations that we have received. And you can see from that emphasis the enormous importance placed then on education. How one educates the young makes this fantastic difference. If you educate them properly, they will have the moral sentiments you desire. If you do not, then all is lost. English deism played a fantastically important role in continental skepticism. According to Lechler, the works of the English deists that were translated and published or circulated included works by Blount, Tollens, Toland, Collins, Woolston, Chubb, Bullenbrook, and Hume. These works had caused a controversy in England, but that controversy had been carried out largely by literary means. Each of these skeptics would write a book or two, there would be dozens of replies, there would be a flurry of back and forth uh, pamphleteering and writing, and then the issue would settle down and, in fact, had pretty much burned itself out by the time Hume published his philosophical essays in 1748. That provoked a last little uh, tail end on it, but that was an end to it. But that's the effect they had in England where, to a very large extent, liberty of discussion was allowed and endorsed. In France, liberty of discussion was not permitted, nor in Spain, nor in Portugal. And there, these works had a fantastic effect in terms of providing a groundswell of opposition to everything that French culture and the church and the government stood for. And that is the way in which they gave birth to the revolution. So have a look at Voltaire's little uh, 
piece on freedom of thought or freedom of sentiment to see how the difference between liberty and oppression looked to one of the principal French minds of the day. Phases of continental skepticism. The early phase through the middle part of the 18th century was deistical. Voltaire himself in correspondence said he had never been such a fool as to deny that there was a god. Criticism largely concentrated on the behavior of the church and the clergy. It's not that they were unwilling to criticize the government, but many of the earlier French skeptics were on good terms with members of the nobility, and they did not, therefore, bite the hand that was feeding them. This phase comes to flower in the work of Voltaire and Rousseau, and it's that work that we will look at most closely here. In the latter phase, the last part of the 18th century, it was openly atheistical, increasingly critical of the political order, not simply of the church, self-consciously materialistic and deterministic. There was a great encyclopedia, which was the work of these French philosophes, the philosophers as they styled themselves, and articles from that encyclopedia exhibit the outlines of this quite clearly, as do some books by writers like Delamaitre, with his Man a Machine, um, Condillac in his Treatise on Sensations, and Dolbach's book, The System of Nature, probably written with the assistance of Diderot. Dolbach is an interesting figure. He was very well off, and he sponsored a circle of free thinkers who met in his uh, salons during the latter part of the French period here, the Continental period. The atheism of these people was a bit of a secret, and in fact there's a story that David Hume once visited one of these meetings by, uh, sponsored by Dolbach, and the topic of atheism came up, and Hume said with an amused chuckle that he was not sure that atheists existed. And Dolbach responded to him gravely that he was sitting at a table full of them. <laughs> so that was a bit of a shock, perhaps, for the good David, who seems to have been a sincere, if somewhat uh, light-handed, deist. Let's focus on some individuals now. Voltaire was the pen name of François-Marie Arouet and was clearly the most brilliant writer of the period, probably of the century. He spent some time in England in the early 18th century and picked up two things there, English deism and English science, the two major things that attracted his interest. He did his best to introduce the ideas of Newton to a French public, and he also introduced many of the works and the arguments of the deists to that public. Voltaire, as I have mentioned before, believed in a first cause, but certainly not in the Jewish or Christian God. His style is vicious and sarcastic. He's openly contemptuous of his enemies. He has no time to spare for them, and when he gets on a roll, no one can stand in his way for sheer verbal brilliance. You might compare him in that respect to Christopher Hitchens, closer to our own time. As an example of Voltaire's thought, he wrote a work in 1759 called Candide, or Optimism. It's an attack on Leibniz's theodicy, which was itself a response to the skeptical writings of Pierre Bayle. The work was prompted by the Lisbon earthquake of 1755. This was an 8.5 to 9.0 earthquake about 200 miles off the coast of Portugal out in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. It destroyed the center of the city of Lisbon, including uh, churches and hospitals. It happened on All Saints Day, November 1st of 1755. Huge fissures opened up in the earth in the middle of the city, 15 feet across. A tidal wave swept in and destroyed dwellings on the, uh, on the coastal area. Fire broke out in the city and destroyed even more than the earthquake had. So it was just a desperate time. About 40,000 people seemed to have died in it, and in particular in one of the Christian hospitals. Uh, all of the patients in the hospital burned to death as the hospital burned down. <laughs> 
in the wake of that disaster, Voltaire dusted off the argument from evil, the old problem of evil, which of course Hume himself uses in his uh, later uh, unpublished writings, and says, look, how can you possibly say that this is the best of all possible worlds? Leibniz had maintained that despite appearances to the contrary, this is the best of all possible worlds, and even in his theodicy has one passage where someone takes a sort of a peek into other possible worlds to see what they're like, to see if any of them are on the whole better than our world, and in fact, they are not. So Voltaire satirizes this by introducing a character in Candide called Dr. Pangloss. Pangloss means answer for everything. And Dr. Pangloss does indeed have an answer for everything. You'll, you'll stump him with something. Why does God permit this? And he'll hesitate for a moment, and then he'll rattle off something that he says is an answer to your difficulty. Now, in his use of ridicule, ridicule here, Voltaire seems to be putting to practice something from earlier and from the English side. In the Deist controversy, uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury had recommended the use of ridicule as a tool in religious controversy. And although I don't recall Voltaire's having actually cited Shaftesbury, that's an interesting possible pattern match between their works. So if you're interested in chasing down possible pattern matches, there would be one you might want to look into a bit. It's notable that during the Deist controversy, the Christians, like Swift and Barclay, took up ridicule as a weapon against Collins and other Deists, not at the expense of argument, but as an additional uh, aspect of their writings. And some of the ridicule that they level upon them is, is actually quite funny. Uh, it doesn't have the same biting, contemptuous edge that Voltaire's satire does. But it's very interesting that in England, where the controversy was resolved without bloodshed, ridicule was a weapon that both sides were willing to make some use of. Kale is, uh, the Kale affair is an interesting one, and I'm just going to touch on this briefly because it shows something of Voltaire's temper of mind. Um, in 18, sorry, 1762, Jean Kale, who is a Protestant uh, cloth merchant living in Toulouse, was executed by the French authorities. The occasion of this was the death of his second son, his younger son. His older son had converted to Catholicism, and since Jean Calais was a Protestant, this caused the family some grief. His younger son was found dead in their home, and originally it was put out that this was a murder. The family later confessed that they had come home to find that he had hung himself. Now, suicide was considered to be a grave crime, and the bodies of people who committed suicide were publicly dishonored. So to spare the body of their son a public dishonor, the family tried to cover up his suicide and claim that it was a murder. When the authorities investigated this, the family acknowledged that no, it actually, they had tried to cover it up this way, but some of the authorities got it in their minds that the father had murdered his son, fearing that he too would convert to Catholicism. Jean Calais was extensively tortured in a vain attempt to get him to confess to murder, which he would not do. And then he was executed. Voltaire was asked to look into this, and although at first suspecting that maybe the family were anti-Catholic fanatics, he very quickly discovered that that was wrong and that there was overwhelming evidence that this was, in fact, simply a suicide. It was too late to save the life of the father, but he ultimately did succeed in getting the sentence annulled. Uh, Louis XV paid the rather handsome sum of 36,000 francs in reparations to his family. But as you can imagine, uh, no love was lost between Voltaire and the Catholic Church, and this was an example of their cruelty and fanaticism that kept Voltaire motivated to the end of his life. Voltaire's specific position on miracles is an interesting one because it owes so little to David Hume. In fact, uh, if you're interested in connections, you ought to check out rather the sixth chapter of Spinoza's, uh, Spinoza's Tractatus, 
because his arguments really more resemble those of Spinoza than those of Hume. First, in his Philosophical Dictionary, he gives the true meaning of miracle, something admirable, from mirare, to wonder, to admire. And he says the stupendous order of nature, the revolution of a hundred millions of worlds around a million of suns, the activity of light, the life of animals, all of these are in the true and natural sense miracles. But that's not the way that most people use the word. According to the common acceptation, he says, we call a miracle the violation of these divine and eternal laws. A solar eclipse at the time of the full moon, when the moon is on the wrong side to create a solar eclipse. Or a dead man walking two leagues and carrying his head in his arms. These things we denominate a miracle. So a miracle in that sense is the violation of mathematical, divine, immutable, eternal laws. By the very expression itself, a miracle is a contradiction in terms. A law cannot at the same time be immutable and violated. If that does not remind you of Spinoza's claim that the common conception of miracle is completely messed up and that miracle really is just a name for our ignorance, then you need to go back and reread Spinoza. Also, Peter Annett is another uh, person that puts forward arguments of this kind. He goes on, for what purpose would God perform a miracle? To accomplish some particular design upon living beings, he would then in reality be supposed to say, I have not been able to effect by my construction of the universe, by my divine decrees, by my eternal laws, a particular object. I'm now going to change my eternal ideas and immutable laws to endeavor to accomplish what I have not been able to do by means of them. This would be an avowal of weakness, not of his power. It would appear in such a being an inconceivable contradiction. Accordingly, therefore, to dare to ascribe miracles to God is, if man can in reality insult God, actually offering him that insult. It is saying to him, you are a weak and inconsistent being. It is, therefore, absurd to believe in miracles. It is, in fact, dishonoring the divinity. For those of you who are keeping track of possible pattern matches between these things and others, have a look at John Stuart Mill's three essays on religion, because Mill, who is raised without any belief in God, actually comes around to saying, you know, if anything, maybe the best explanation for these phenomena would be that there is a sort of God, but only a demigod, one of limited power, one who, like the demiurge in Plato, struggles against the recalcitrance of the material with which he is working, and with the best will in the world, he just can't make it come out quite right. So have a look there for a possible influence of Voltaire upon John Stuart Mill. The philosophers, says Voltaire, make no answer to these objections but by slightly raising their shoulders and by a smile. In other words, they don't believe in the miracles at all. But the Christian philosophers say, we are believers in the miracles of our holy religion. We believe them by faith and not by our reason, which we are very cautious how we listen to, for when faith speaks, it is well known that reason ought to be silent. Now, here is a good example, I think, of Voltaire's unfairness in the representation of those with whom he disagrees. Those who took the deist controversy class last summer will remember very outspoken statements by Joseph Butler in The Analogy of Religion, by John Leland in his view of the principal deistical writers, very much in favor of reason, open discussion. They saw no opposition whatsoever between faith and reason, but it is a part of the rhetorical tactics of Voltaire that he wants to paint his enemies as opposers to reason and as people who use faith in opposition to reason, who appeal to faith when they turn away from reason. That opposition is part of his grand strategy, and it is a part of the strategy that has played out even to our own times, as you'll recognize if you think of the works of some people like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens. How about prophecies? Again, Voltaire seems not to have been influenced by Hume, but rather by his own reading on the subject and perhaps by some of the English deists such as Collins and Woolston who had attacked the idea of literal fulfillment of prophecy. So in his philosophical dictionary, in the article Prophecies, he makes several points. Here are a few of the key ones. The Christians, he says, interpret the Jewish prophecies of the Messiah as being fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. But the Jews themselves could never recognize him as the fulfillment 
of their own prophecies. Now, think about that for a moment. Who were the earliest Christians? Where did Christianity flourish? Where did it first expand on the day of Pentecost? In Jerusalem, among Jews. So for him to say that the Jews themselves could never recognize him as the fulfillment of their own prophecies is really to say that some Jews did and some did not, and those who didn't, didn't. But again, by an adroit turn of phrase, Voltaire has managed to conceal the fact that the earliest Christians were themselves persuaded, and very largely persuaded, on the basis of the argument from prophecy. He also maintains that the Jewish prophecies are themselves contradictory, so it's not even possible someone should have fulfilled them all, and in fact, he's very broadly casting doubt on the idea that any of them are anything more than guesses, some shrewd, some blind, and their fulfillments, some by happenstance, some by forcing events into the mold of the prophecy, reinterpreting the prophecy, and so on. He points out that there are prophecies in the literature of many of the world's religions, and he names a couple attributed to Zoroaster and Confucius, the idea being that this is a phenomenon that's been going on all over the place, and it's only by a sort of cherry-picking that those who appeal to the argument from prophecy can make their argument seem to be cogent. Finally, he ridicules a few modern uh, prophets, uh, Peter Zhuyu, the two Eliases, and goes out of his way to talk about uh, Zhuyu's prediction of the end of the papacy, which was supposed to have come crumbling down in 1689. And when that failed, he reissued a prophecy saying that, ah, he was off by a year, it would end in 1690. And, and then he had a word thrown in that it would be at the end of this century or or the beginning of the next one, sort of giving a fuzzy boundary to the end of the papacy. You can imagine the fun that Voltaire has with that. I'll close with a posthumous discovery, which I'm going to quote from an article from the British Quarterly Review that just mentions this in a footnote. I've given the reference on the slide. Condorcet was one of the French philosophers who wrote A Life of Voltaire. But in an appendix to the 1791 edition of this, and remember, the French Revolution has commenced. The storming of the Bastille has taken place in 1789. A Swedish traveler examining Voltaire's library found a copy of Calmet on the Bible. It's a large commentary, folio volumes, with sheets inserted on which were written all the difficulties Calmet had stated, but not one word of the explanation of these which Calmet supplies. In other words, he had gone through, he had looked for objections, not by finding them himself, but by piggybacking on the work of others to discover such objections. And he had written these down without taking any notice of the answers to the objections, so he was basically collecting an arsenal of stones which he could sling at his adversaries. This, adds the Swede, formerly a great admirer of Voltaire, is not honorable. Rousseau wrote in French, but he's a Swiss citizen. He was always fond of signing his, himself a citizen of Geneva. Uh, and he wrote Emile, a novel, in 1762. That novel, and this will give you a sense of how the French authorities responded, um, that novel was condemned. I believe it was burned. A warrant went out for Rousseau's arrest. And, and that largely because of his profession of faith of a Savoyard vicar, which is a passage in the fourth book of Emile, where in the person of a vicar of Savoy, uh, Rousseau lays out some of his own creed and his own objections to the creed of others. Um, Voltaire loved Emile, and when he learned that Rousseau was on the run, he wrote, I shall always love the author of the Vicar Savoyard. Whatever he has done and whatever he may do, let him come here to Fernie, where Voltaire was hanging out at the time. He must come. I shall receive him with open arms. He shall be master here more than I. I shall treat him like my own son. So Rousseau received a response, and the response was, we're going to burn your books and haul you in to prison. And I, I think that's a was pretty typical of their response. Let's see why he was uh, viewed that way. Here's the Savoyard Vicar on Miracles. Uh, it's part of a dialogue. The, the more orthodox people say, but God himself hath spoken. Listen to the voice of Revelation. To which the vicar 
shows himself responding, That indeed is another thing God hath spoken. This is saying a great deal. But to whom hath, hath he spoken? He hath spoken to man. How comes it then that I hear nothing of it? He hath appointed others to teach you his word. I understand you. There are certain men who are to tell me what God hath said. I had much rather have heard it from himself. This, had he so pleased, he could easily have done, and I should then have run no risk of deception. Will it be said I am secured from that by his manifesting the mission of his messengers by miracles? Where are those miracles to be seen? Are they related only in books? Pray, who wrote those books? Men. Who were witnesses to these miracles? Men. Always human testimony. It is always men who tell me what other men have told them. What a number of those are constantly between me and the deity. We are always reduced to the necessity of examining, comparing, and verifying such evidence. Oh, that God had deigned to have saved me all this anxiety. Should I, in that case, have served him with a less willing heart? Surely God could, if he had wished, have just spoken to me directly, and that's how I would have preferred it. Um, and again, and this was, these were the passages that gave such offense and that occasioned the condemnation of Rousseau's book. Uh, he says it, in that same work, it would be necessary in order for us to be persuaded of this, to be perfectly acquainted with the laws of chance and the doctrine of probabilities, to judge correctly what prediction could not be accomplished without a miracle, to know the genius of the original languages, to distinguish what is predictive in these languages and what is only figurative. If you were in the class last summer, you will remember that arguments like these were put forward by Herbert of Sherbury in his De Veritate, and then were retailed by Charles Blount, who more or less translated a portion of De Veritate. But this is the objection. It would just take too much study. How can a normal guy like me possibly master it all? Um, again, and this is a quotation from Rousseau, it would be requisite for us to know what facts are agreeable to the established order of nature and what are not so. To be able to say how far an artful man may not fascinate the eyes of the simple and even astonish the most enlightened spectators, to know of what kind a miracle should be and the authenticity it ought to bear, not only to claim our belief, but to make it criminal to doubt it. Notice the criminal to doubt it bit because, of course, such doubts were often treated as criminally prosecutable things at the time. To compare the proofs of false and true miracles and discover the certain means of distinguishing them. Now, here I think is an evidence that Rousseau had not read some of the orthodox responses to the Deus, because if he had read, for example, Charles Leslie, he would have known that Leslie does in fact give responses to these things. Leslie has his four marks, for example, by which we can distinguish undoubted miracles from those that may be doubted. And after all, to tell why the deity should choose in order to confirm the truth of his word, to make use of means which in their turn require confirmation, as if he took delight in playing upon the credulity of mankind and had purposely avoided the direct means to persuade them. That kind of argument, God should have done it more clearly, not only has its roots in some of Wollstone's work, the deist controversy, but comes up again in the 19th century in the work, for example, of Francis William Newman, Cardinal Newman's younger brother, who wrote a book called The Phases of Faith. And it's an argument that he uses persistently there that God could have done it so much more clearly, why then did he not do this in a way that would be plain to all? This is treated in Butler's analogy of religion as well, so it's not as though the objection had not been anticipated, but I think Rousseau simply didn't know that literature at all. There's a fascinating passage, and I recommend it to those of you who like to connect the dots on these things, in a book by Henry Rogers called The Eclipse of Faith. Rogers has, uh, toward the end of that book, a sequence called uh, The Paradise of Fools, in which people who object to the means that have been used to authenticate a revelation are put in a sort of virtual reality experiment where they are allowed to try to authenticate a revelation by some other means and then to see how people respond to those. And 
it's, it's fascinating and hilarious, and it's about 18 pages long. So I just commend you uh, to read Henry Rogers' book, The Eclipse of Faith, and look for that passage in it on the Paradise of Fools and see how he handles this objection there. Uh, on prophecies, the Savoyard Vicar again has much to say. Um, to give them such weight requires three things, the concurrence of which is impossible. These are that I should, in the first place, be a witness to the delivery of the prophecy, I myself. Next, that I should be witness also to the event. And lastly, that it should be clearly demonstrated to me that such an event could not have occurred by accident. For though a prophecy were as precise, clear, and determinate as an axiom of geometry, yet as the perspicuity of a prediction made at random does not render the accomplishment of it impossible, that accomplishment, when it happens, proves nothing, in fact, concerning the foreknowledge of him who predicted it. You see, therefore, to what your pretended supernatural proofs, your miracles, and your prophecies reduce us, to the folly of believing them all on the credit of others and of submitting the authority of God, speaking to our reason, to that of man. Now, that sort of attempt to lay out criteria for prophecy is something that will for sure be picked up later and that the criteria had already been laid down by some of the earlier writers, particularly Chandler and others who interacted with Wollstone and Collins as Zachary Pierce as another, Thomas Sherlock as another. Uh, I'll simply note that the demand that he be a witness to the delivery of the prophecy and that he himself be a witness to the fulfillment of necessity means that they can't be very far apart in time, which undermines one of the possible ways that we could say that it was out of the scope of human foresight to have foreseen the thing thus prophesied. Uh, again, though, you can see how Rousseau is sort of sticking a finger in the eye of people who make these traditional arguments. Okay, back now to the, to the room. That concludes my rapid run through the phases of continental skepticism. I'm sorry that I had not the time to be able to develop a more elaborate discussion of some of the later writers, but of them in particular, the Baron Dolbach is one that you would want to have a look at for his work on the system of nature. It was originally published without the author's name, but became tremendously influential uh, among skeptics in later times, so that work is one that you'll want to keep an eye on.